Thanks for stopping by Big Top Gaming. My name is Brian, and in this video, we're going to kind of continue our discussion on faction identity surrounding the tactics cards. So I feel like as one of the however many admins there are of the Free Folk Facebook group that I am contractually obligated to go with Free Folk next, even though I had the images saved down for the Baratheons and it was really hard to not do them. But anyways, we're going into the Free Folk and this is since this is the first tactics deck that we're doing for the 2021 update, I want to try and kind of lay some ground rules or at least expectations for these. I'm not going to be doing a side-by-side -side comparison for the cards that were in 1.6 that are now going into the 2021 update, but I will say that there's probably going to be some points where I at least kind of tie back to them to kind of show some of the evolution of them because I do think it's a really interesting thing that's happened with some of them. So before we go any further, let's go ahead and kind of talk about what we think the, or well, at least what I think, you know, what we think. It's not like you're sitting here talking on this video with me. I just want to kind of put out what I think the overall faction identity is for the Free Folk, and then we can kind of get into the tactics cards, and at, towards the end I'll talk about kind of my supporting thoughts on why I think the way I do. So uh, Free Folk in the beginning of their existence in A Song of Ice and Fire had a pretty volatile history. They came out right off the gates, or right out the gates, sorry, and they were kind of heralded as the worst faction in the game. And that wasn't a real big, like, difficult thing to say because the Lannisters were quite flushed out and were a terror for a long time. Uh, people were starting to kind of understand that the Stark Tactics deck was definitely the most broken one in the game. And uh, the Night's Watch was just ridiculous because they were built on the back of Sworn Brothers. So when Free Folk hit, they just kind of didn't have the same oomph, right? They uh, only had their starter box, and things just weren't clicking very well with people, considering the way that the tactics deck worked, and, uh, you know, what was what, what was available to them at the time with the starter deck, the, the starter box, sorry. And, uh, you know, it, it took till Adepticon, which I think was right about when the Free Folk were released, it was really close to that, where uh, someone had ended up borrowing some of the demo stuff for Free Folk, and ended up catapulting into first place for that first big tournament for a song of ice and fire um, i was one of the contributing members to that person's win record my poor great john umber list just could not quite recover from that beating but uh it definitely was an eye-opening experience to play against someone of that level at that time as the free folk kind of evolved through releases uh, they kind of got catapulted to being one of the best factions in the game, if not the best, right? Um, they just could play so wide and really didn't care about what you ended up doing to their Free Folk uh, Raiders because they just brought so many of them. I mean, personally, I own eight different units because that's just kind of what you put on the table in a competitive mindset. You know, eight to six was, was pretty standard. I think maybe eight's a little bit more on the, the Yahoo side, but... Uh, you know, they, they play a wide list, they play to the scenario, and they don't really kill a whole lot. They just end up existing for a really long time because there's so many bodies that you have to chop through. So uh, fast forward to 1.7, instead of having this like horde mentality in the game where the table doesn't really suit or doesn't really like it's the table size isn't really conducive to having a really wide list i mean you had to plot out your deployment like from from the first drop because you would fill up the entire board and sometimes depending on how wide of a list you played you would almost have to deploy things behind your own stuff or keep them off the table on certain scenarios that's not a thing anymore because there's no such thing as like the a deployment zone where you can't fit two rows deep but uh you know that that horde mentality was kind of the identity of the faction then and the tactics deck kind of just didn't really have a whole lot of value for the free folk uh there were some cool things you could do in here here and there but for the most part it didn't really function it wasn't like a there wasn't a clear you know goal in mind with the free folk tactics deck in 1.7 i think that's changed drastically and instead of kind of having this horde mentality especially when we factor in some of the previews for units that we've seen uh, I think that the faction identity for the Free Folk army 
is coordination tactics. So in order to look into that, let's go ahead and start with some of the first cards here and, and roll our way through the deck. So to get this north of the wall party started, we're going to go with uh, regroup and reform. This card triggers at the start of a friendly turn. Target two friendly infantry units in long range with, a, with each other, uh, or of each other. Uh, remove up to four models from one of these units and restore that many wounds to the other. You may then move one attachment from one of these units to the other, replacing a model like normal, or switch two friendly attachments in the unit. So, uh, regroup and reform, you, there's definitely some huge changes here. Essentially, it kind of does the same thing. You take four units away from one unit to put them into another. But being able to switch the attachments means that you're going to be benefited as a Free Folk player from bringing a diverse uh, suite of attachments, which before it was kind of like you, you're you really bringing a lot of the same ones. Skin Changers comes to mind, Free Folk Raiders, and maybe Styers Chosen back then, not so much anymore because they've changed so much. But uh, there's the ability to kind of be a little bit more flexible with this card is extremely welcome and really kind of, you know, opens the door to this idea that Free Folk really base themselves on coordinating their units to make sure that their attacks are as efficient as possible. One of the other small uh, changes that kind of comes in with this card that is not something that I think a lot of people will notice right off the bat is that the trigger and the wording has gotten a lot less clunky. Uh, the original iteration of Regroup and Reform ended up triggering at the start of a unit's activation, and the unit that you ended up activating had to be the unit that you restored wounds to. Uh, you couldn't take wounds away from it. And the reason why that's a big deal is because with the Cave Dweller Savages, they now have kind of that Umber Berserker... Uh, attack stat where as they lose ranks they get better and uh, with this particular card you could do something like uh, you know have your cave dweller savages pull ranks out or pull pull models out of them to make their attack stat better and then fluff up a unit that might need those wounds uh, a, a little bit uh, more than they would you know because you're kind of like getting a good uh, getting good economy out of being able to boost the attack stat of the cave dweller savages and then, uh, you know, support a unit that needs it, whereas before you weren't really able to do that under some of the 1.7 changes. So uh, regroup and reform is kind of a nice, you know, uh, red carpet into my thoughts that free folk really are all about coordinating their attacks. Being able to switch around your attachments is super huge, and with the way that raiders work now that they discount uh attachments by one point given that most of them are one point uh means that you can get some really cool things to happen with being able to bring situational attachments and make sure that you can react to the situation in whatever way you whatever way you see fit so the next card up in discussion is kind of like the 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 t-ball hit for me for what my uh ideas on what the uh free folk faction was kind of bringing to the table now in terms of their identity and its coordination tactics it's a brand new card this is new to the to the faction in general it happens to trigger at the start of any turn and you target two friendly infantry units that are within short range of one another until the end of the turn both units gain any abilities on the other unit and then you can immediately trigger any one unused start of turn order from either of those units so, uh, again, with, with Free Folk, essentially we're still going to be going pretty wide with the faction. And we can take something like the Lowly Raider and give them some really cool abilities that maybe like the Followers of Bone have or something like that. And uh, there are multiple benefits in the army for keeping your stuff kind of close together and making sure that multiple engagements are happening. Kind of pulling away from that 1.6 feel where you just needed to have a lot of things happening uh, with the old gang up wording and everything like that especially with the old tactics deck but not to to dwell on old stuff this new thing here ends up making it so that you kind of want things to pair off and you want them to be diverse in what they can do so that when you do end up doing playing something like coordination tactics you can kind of get uh, extra efficiency out of those two units because say it is something like followers of bone they charge in and do their business after like a raider unit's already engaged with them and has kind of taken some wounds or something like that they kind of become less effective 
Then you play coordination tactics, and they can become, you know, it's basically like getting another activation out of those, uh, um, out of those followers of bone. Now it's not the exact same because they don't roll as many dice, they don't hit as well, but uh, in general, it's just nice to be able to get some extra abilities on a unit. Imagine like turning your free folk raiders into something like cave dweller savages that just get that base sundering, and if they're missing ranks, they get better at fighting. Uh, just it, this is a really unique and interesting card, and I feel like it's probably one of the most significant additions to the Free Folk Tactics deck, or alterations to the Free Folk Tactics deck. And, uh, you know, like I said, it is a t-ball hit for me being able to say that coordination is the name of the game with Free Folk, but uh, this this kind of really kind it really showcases that. Next up off the top of the deck is There's Too Many. So this card is definitely one that I ended up having to either build an army around in order to get use out of it, or it was very frequently one of the first ones that I pitched in order to cycle it out of my hand and just be done with it. Uh, but now, uh, it triggers when an enemy is performing a panic test before the dice are rolled. That enemy suffers neg one to that roll and uh, plus one wound on failure for each of your friendly units within short range with uh, more remaining ranks than that unit, up to three. So uh, there's too many's gone through some big changes, right? Um, you don't have to have a ton of things around your opponent's stuff in order to make that panic test worse. Um, also, if you only have one thing, then it does something, which is really nice. You know, it, that's kind of the reason why I ended up pitching There's Too Many a lot of times when I played it, because it just was never... Uh, it was always so, like, conditional in order to make it work. But this one here just kind of has that immediate effect. Like, if your opponent is taking a panic test, likely they're taking it from having taken an attack from one of your units, and hopefully if they have more... or if they have less ranks, then you can kind of... Uh, you know, you get some extra bonuses out of that. But, well, you'd want them to have less ranks anyways because that's how you get the card to work. But there's plenty of ways in Free Folk to make sure that you're hitting hard enough to shave off some of those ranks or making sure that you're getting a new fresh unit into one when the attrition's already kind of started happening. So I think There's Too Many is just a really good card right now, especially with the way that Panic Test works. I think a lot of the morale stats have kind of gotten balanced a little bit where it's not impossible for people to start failing them. And this ends up getting you back to almost that that old panic test because in 1.7, of course, the panic tests are changing to where it's no longer D3 plus one; it's just a straight D3. But there's too many kind of resurrects that old, uh, you know. No matter what, if you fail this, you're taking at least two. So it gives free folk the extra little push that they might need. Uh, it makes something like the lowly raider unit extremely dangerous and i think it's a phenomenal change to the way the card works i think that it really it, it really speaks to the idea of being able to get more benefits if you have more units around them and if you don't you can still get something out of it it's just a very adaptive card or, or flexible card that i think is go gonna go uh, nicely into a lot of free folk builds regardless of how you decide to put them together Next up, we have the card Diversion Tactics. Now, this is a slight evolution on the name, at least, because the previous version of this was called Distraction Tactics, and that one in general was just really difficult to kind of get to work because of the way that Free Folk ended up kind of evolving their play style, where, you know, we didn't really care too much about getting engaged by multiple things until Skin Changers came out, and then di the uh, Distraction Tactics kind of worked a little bit more frequently then, but other than that, it was just kind of like, cool if I get it, but most of the time you were just kind of feeding them one unit at a time. Now with Diversion Tactics. This triggers after an enemy unit completes a melee attack, and if the defender has already activated this round, target one other friendly unit within long range, and it performs a maneuver action. So this is a cool way to get some extra movement. Kind of makes it so that you don't have to get... You're not punished for activating a unit and kind of like feeding it forward as part of the peace trade to get that started. Because I think in uh, A Song of Ice and Fire, it can get really um, nerve-wracking or you can get a little anxious about starting a peace trading game because, you know, the, the there are so few units in general and you kind of feel bad for just vaulting any resource out there, especially now since raiders are costing you a little bit more points and they're not so easy to get rid of. You know, we haven't seen the new rules on uh, um, 
on the skin changers yet, so we don't know how that's going to work with the bears. But with uh, the rest of the army in general, just kind of looking at it, you can do something like put uh, a unit forward just saying this is the unit that's going to get charged first, and that's okay. Because then that means that sacrificing that unit's uh, you know well-being means that another unit behind them can then just kind of maneuver up and get into the flank or maybe get a charge that would have been harder to get before. So it kind of makes your opponent really think about whether they want to come into something that you end up kind of dangling in front of them. And if they don't, then cool beans. It means that you've gotten some extra threat extension on your army and your opponents just decided to leave you with this extra resource. You know, I'm, I'm thinking about something like uh, the, the Fen Warriors, right? So when those things first came out, I was super duper stoked. I bought like four boxes of them and I was like ready and raring to go. And then after I read their rules, I was like, man, these things do just not work. But now when we look at how taunt works in, in a uh, uh, chorus with diversion tactics, the Fen can run up and just say, here I am, charge me. And then even do something like taunt your opponent to charge you. And since they have, since early game, they'll have a bunch of ranks left, they're likely to fail that. I think it kind of, not to kind of toilet bowl into this discussion about Fen Warriors, but I definitely think that those have a lot more value. And Diversion Tactics is one of the cards that really kind of gives them that extra value. And you can kind of see that echo into the rest of it, as or the rest of the army as well, because whatever you put forward, your opponent's probably going to want to try and get into it right away, because most people think Free Folk are super duper easy to get rid of, but no matter what, you're unlikely to wipe out the whole unit at once. And Diversion Tactics can do something like put, uh, you know, some spear wives, or spear wives into your uh, flank, and then you're having a bad time because they're chucking spears at you from the side, and then after that they get to charge right away and retreat if you have a matriarch in there. So it just can get really, really nasty really quick. Uh, diversion Tactics is just a phenomenal add to this faction. Next up in the discussion is Overwhelming Assault. Now this is a replacement for Group Assault and triggers when a friendly unit is performing a melee attack before rolling their attack dice. If the attacker has more remaining ranks than the defender, you choose one thing. If the defender is engaged by two or more enemies, uh, you choose an, an additional one. Uh, so the, the modes that are available here out of the three are uh, this attack may re-roll any attack dice, this attack gains critical blow, or this attack gains sundering. So, uh, it's overwhelming assaults kind of gotten a lot more stipulations than it used to. It, it was just, you know, if you had something engaged with it already, you got crit blow and sundering. It was really fun, and it worked out pretty well usually because you were kind of, when you committed two units in, it was just a good way to try and get those additional ranks in and make it so they were just chewing on free folk raiders all day. But with Overwhelming Assault now, uh, you're kind of stacking the game out. So you probably, if your opponent has less ranks than you, it's because they've kind of chewed through another unit and it's maybe stuck there. And you can send in now a new fresh unit and not only have more ranks to be able to choose one, but then if you're engaged with that other unit that's kind of been softening them up, you get to choose another mode. So you can still do something like get your critical blow and sundering, but you can also do things like if there's a prolonged uh, a prolonged engagement, you can just re-roll those attack dice, which is really nice since most free folk things hit on fours, and you just get that extra, you know, output for some of those things. Or something like Cave Dweller Savages, where if they've been sitting there for a while, they get to do a, a lot more... Uh, they get to roll a lot more dice than what they did when they started out fresh, so being able to re-roll and giving them something like Critical Blow might be fun. But in general, Overwhelming Assault is just another card that kind of plays into this coordination tactics where, you know, you're either getting this coordination mindset because one unit has already softened it up and is really, like, lacking and needs another unit to come in and help do work. Uh, you know, whether that unit is still there or not is kind of, you know, relevant to at least overwhelming assault stipulations, but you at least get to take advantage of being able to play to your faction's strength, which is making sure that you've got units working together instead of just kind of being their own separate little modules. Next up we come 
to the card that is probably the one that I will mourn the most in its passing, and that's Surrounded and Exposed. Now, previously, Surrounded and Exposed was really good because you had a bunch of units and you could just totally shut down another player's unit. It was an extremely powerful card. I would almost argue that it was probably the most powerful card outside of Swift Advance in the Free Folk deck, but uh, now it's kind of warped a little bit, and it triggers at the start of any turn, and you target one enemy unit, for each one of your friendly units within short range with more remaining ranks than that enemy, they gain one condition token. Uh, it's not to say that Surrounded and Exposed has become a not real great card. It's uh, no matter what, you're going to be able to get condition tokens on something, especially, in, well, I mean, you not no matter what, because you do, do have to have units that are a little bit stronger than them, but this is kind of a good late game card, maybe mid game card, where you've kind of sandpapered some of those ranks off, and if you've got a couple units hanging around, it means that you can make that unit a little bit easier to deal with, whether uh, you kind of hinder its uh, offensive output by putting weakened tokens on it. You know, making it so that uh, a strong unit has to uh, re-roll their armor saves when they end up passing them with vulnerable. And then if you're playing other things that might have vicious, then you'll be able to uh, get those panic tokens on to make sure that their panic tests are less likely to, to succeed. I think that Surrounded and Exposed is definitely probably the biggest uh, kick to the gut for the Free Folk deck other than losing Swift Advance. But I think that this iteration of it, it still kind of plays to those strengths of this coordination, you know, style of play. And it's still quite effective, even if you're not just kind of turning a unit completely off and kind of throwing a wrench in the gears of your opponent. I, I will miss my old Surrounded and Exposed, but I do welcome this, this variation on the, the style of the card. The final card in the Tactics deck is definitely one that I think a lot of people will consider maybe their favorite in terms of the Free Folk flavor, and that's going to be the Endless Horde. Uh, this, this ends up triggering when a friendly NCU claims the Maneuver Zone. You replace that zone's effect with deploy one Free Folk Raider unit or one previously destroyed friendly Free Folk Infantry unit within long range of a friendly table edge. Attachments are not returned to that unit, but are replaced with an additional model uh, uh, of that infantry type instead. So uh, the they kind of cleaned up this card and consolidated it a little bit because the old card triggered when you claimed a zone, but then it got to you know not have an activation token on it when you claimed the maneuver zone. So at least you got to put in an extra thing regardless of which zone you took. But, um, you know, it really wasn't all that effective unless you actually had the maneuver zone. And it also had to return a unit back into play. So that's one of the biggest changes with this one. Other than just making sure that you have to claim the maneuver zone, you can also do this super duper early to just flop a Free Folk Raider unit in from the ether. So previously you had to have a destroyed unit to make this work so you could sit there camping on something like the endless horde in your hand from the from turn one until the final turn in the game because maybe your opponent has been super duper unlucky and has not killed a single free folk raider or anything unit that you've put into them but with this at least you can do this super early like uh you know there's you know thinking about like you know activating this on turn one and throwing a NCU on the maneuver right away and then jamming another Free Folk Raider unit in. It, it, it's kind of an interesting idea. It's not something that I think I'd be aiming to do on turn one because they'd be deploying behind all my stuff, but the Endless Horde is just a, you know, it, it's like I keep talking about coordination tactics and not just the card, but the concept of it. And the Endless Horde really does kind of play towards that because not only do you get the chance to get a Free Folk Infantry unit back that you've lost early because you're kind of doing the... you're just playing in the middle anyways and just kind of throwing bodies at the problem, but you uh, also could bring in a new Raider unit and put it in a place where you might not have had the support because things are going off and doing their own thing. The Endless Horde is just such a, a phenomenal card and is extremely flexible even though you know it's just kind of one of those things that I think people look at it and they say, oh yeah, you get a new unit, whatever. But that's a new unit that could take a back field objective and free some of your other units to go up and start 
contributing to the game, or it could be the unit that turns on some of your other cards and other abilities that we've kind of talked about and get that coordination feel going that really kind of starts teasing out the identity of what the Free Folk are actually doing in the 2021 update. I hope you enjoyed my kind of assessment on what the faction identity is for the Free Folk in the 2021 update. Now, I did use uh, some of the new uh, rules that have been leaked through all the Vision in Flames articles to kind of deduce my opinion, uh, not just, you know, it, it's kind of funny because I said it in the Greyjoy where you could kind of, or the Greyjoy video where you can kind of take the tactics deck and get a feel for it or feel for the whole faction and with free folk i think you still you can do that now more than you could before because i think in the in the 1.6 version and before you'd look at the tactics deck and be like you know i could literally not play with this thing and just fish for swift advance all game and maybe surrounded and exposed and be perfectly fine you know the the deck itself just didn't really jive well with things and it kind of made the free folk feel like they weren't tactful but in this update it really does kind of make the free folk faction feel more like an army that's working together because essentially when you do kind of live beyond the wall uh, you would think that you would have to really lean on your neighbor in order to make sure that you can survive and fight and get through things. And I think they really communicated that well in the Free Folk update for 2021. And, uh, you know, I I've been kind of putzing around with lists based off of the things that have been revealed in some of the Visions and Flames. And a lot of my list ends up having uh, a lot more diverse suite of attachments you know that's one of the things that i always really was remiss about in the 1.6 and previous versions is that you really ended up running out of points to kind of a throw attachments in as a free folk player because you were usually doing things like maxing out the width of your list through free folk raiders and trappers and making sure that you could get three ncus to kind of you know play that activation game and kind of make it so your opponent had a really uh, had a lot of difficult choices to make and then when the skin changers came out attachment economy got really weird because you kind of got um an extra body on the table with the bear and that was the thing that kind of like was the patch to make the uh coordination tactics work that they had back then and you know now i think that you know i haven't seen anything in terms of how the skin changers are supposed to work now but uh, I think that they'll still be a pretty big asset to the army especially when we look at raiders when they can discount attachments because that bear is going to really push forward into making sure that you can do some of these things that take multiple units but the other thing on top of that is that the tactics deck also kind of builds around ranks a little bit and making sure that units can switch resources, whether it be wounds, attachments, or abilities. And uh, I don't think you'll kind of get into this whole ham-fisted mo moment where, uh, you know, you're just throwing as many bears on the table as you can and as many raiders on the table as you can. I think it really gives the Free Folk players a lot of opportunity to come up with some unique and diverse list building. And uh, I'm, I'm extremely excited to kind of see what happens with free folk in the future you know i i they were one of the factions that i really leaned hard into and i'm really looking forward to seeing them kind of come into their own whereas before it was just really kind of a gimmick for how they played and i'm looking forward to just you know really feeling like the free folk feel like the free folk and i hope you are too I have made the commitment to make one of these videos for every single faction going into the 1.7 update, so I hope you enjoy watching these. It's really important, not just as a player of the faction that I talk about, but as someone who's just going to be playing against these other factions so that you get an idea of what your opponent's going to be doing, because you can kind of see what the units are, what they do. The cards are in front of you, but that tactics deck is secret, so until you've played against it a bunch of times, you really don't know what's going on, so this should be a good tool for people to kind of get a jump start on being able to get into the game and not feel like they have to go through the uh, the blows to kind of understand what their opponent's trying to do to them. So uh, I, I look forward to making some of the next ones. Uh, let me know what you think should be next in the comment section below. Uh, that's going to be that we'll do that we'll say the next one i make is going to be uh you know after the first few days go by with this video you folks are picking which one i'm talking about next